On February 9th of 2004, 21-year-old UMass student Maura Murray drove from her dorm in Amherst, Massachusetts to the White Mountains of New Hampshire. At approximately 7.27 p.m., Maura spun out her 1996 Saturn on a hairpin turn on Route 112 in North Haverhill. There has never been a credible sighting of Maura since. Maura is five foot, seven inches tall. She weighs 120 pounds, and she has brown hair and hazel eyes. If you have any information regarding Maura's disappearance, please submit it to us, the Murray family at Maura Murray family direct at gmail.com or the New Hampshire State Police Cold Case Unit. This is Missing Maura Murray. Welcome back to the Missing Maura Murray podcast. I'm Tim here today with Lance in the Crawl Space Studios in Wormtown. Lance, how are you today? I cannot be better. Could not be better. How are you, Tim? I'm doing well. And Lance, for this episode, we speak to an old friend of ours. His name is Captain, and he does the True Crime Garage podcast with uh, his pal Nick. And, uh, and they do a great show. And we were on their show back in March of 2019. Go check out the episodes on Brian Schaefer if, uh, if you aren't familiar with those. But they obviously do a, uh, a very popular podcast, Lance. And Captain is sort of ingrained in the community of Maura Murray, sort of whether he likes it or not. Um, he sort of <laughs> becomes um, certain people's unofficial, like, sounding board, I think. And, uh, and so he, he finds himself sort of captivated by the community, engulfed in the mystery, knowing all the people involved. And so that's why we wanted to talk to him. Yeah. And he's also uh, sort of a sounding board on our end. I mean, he does uh, talk with people in the community, has talked to Julie Murray. And us too. And us as well. And he's also, uh, he's someone that you can go to uh, if you're understanding things a little bit less clearly than you might want to, because he is... Uh, looking at it from a distance, whereas we're sort of in the thick of it, uh, not even sort of, we are in the thick of it, and sometimes it's hard to see that. And uh, it's it's refreshing to get an outsider perspective, and it's also uh, interesting to hear what he has to say as the outsider, not as a podcaster, but just as sort of a human being, yeah. and just wondering why certain things go down the way they do in Moore's case and the community that is involved with uh, trying to find answers for her as opposed to any of the number of cases that uh, True Crime Garage discusses over the course of, of a year. You know, they don't have that type of community uh, tides that 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 come and go with a lot of what they talk about. But this one with Moore, it just keeps rising and rising and he's fascinated by it. It's interesting to hear. It is. And uh, one of the things we talk about is a new GoFundMe push that the Murray family is making for samples to be tested. And you can find it. There is a link in the show notes or you can search on GoFundMe for Find Maura Murray, the one that was started by Julie Murray, Maura's sister. And they actually achieved their goal within the first few days of posting that GoFundMe. They've exceeded their goal. They raised the amount just because they've exceeded the goal. Don't let that deter you from donating. Don't say, oh, they hit the goal, so I'm good. The more that is put into that fund, uh, the more testing can be done on searches that uh, have happened in the past. We've done searches that we have samples we'll be uh, sending in with this money now. They've done searches uh outside of, 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 you know, telling people through our show and, and they have samples now. So, uh, these samples are not cheap. You have to break up, uh, pieces of concrete to pull possible DNA out of it. You have to do a lot of really micro stuff to get, uh, to get any answers out of something that's possibly been there for 16 years and they're not cheap. So, yeah. And even if all the samples are paid for by the GoFundMe money, that's already been donated they still will use the remainder of that money for good use. And uh, and we did hear it might go to a reward if there is something um, additional. So I think that's something really interesting to add to the equation that we've already been working inside of for so long now is, is throw that into the equation and maybe that 
changes things up. Yeah, absolutely, because I think it's a, a, a fact that nobody really talks about that often, but if you do find something in these samples, if, if money is spent to sample these, uh, to, to get results out of these uh, samples that were collected, there has to be a follow-up. There has to be subsequent action that happens, whether it's contacting the authorities, and now the authorities have to put some resources into uh, whatever subsequent action needs to happen based on what that sample is. So it's not going to be... It's not going to be uh, the the golden goose of answers when you when you find out that DNA might match something uh, with Morris family. It only will lead to further action that obviously needs funding. Okay, everybody. So I hope you can donate if you can afford it. If not, please share or do both. That'd be great. Thank you very much for listening and check out True Crime Garage if you aren't already a subscriber, which you probably are. And I just want to say real quickly, we are doing another live show with True Crime Obsessed. That's Patrick and Jillian of True Crime Obsessed. We're doing it at the Royale Nightclub in Boston. The Royale Boston, it's on Tremont Street. It's on March 20th. Uh, the following show is in Philadelphia on the 21st. We were just alerted to the fact that there is only 25 tickets left. Crazy. At the show at Royale in Boston on March 20th. So if you were planning on going... March 20th, you have to get your tickets now because it's going to sell out in the next probably, you know, probably over the weekend this thing's going to sell out. So uh, good news all around on that because it'll be a great turnout. Uh, it'll be us there with Maggie Freeling and Patrick and Jillian, and then we're going to head over to Philly after. But let's, uh, let's sell out that Boston show. 25 tickets left. All right, everybody. Thank you very much for listening. El Capitan is joining us from the True Crime Garage podcast. What is going on, Captain? It's good to be here. It's good to be seen, and it's good to see you. Really good to talk to you. The last time we actually did an episode together officially was when we were in the, uh, as uh, Bill Thomas would say, the Commodious um, studios that, that you have there in Ohio. Uh, the last time we did an episode together, since it's been almost a year, far too long. Yes, and last time I smelled your musk was at CrimeCon. Ah, that's right. That's right. You do have a bit of an obsession with uh, with my uh, pheromones. Yes. And your fashion, too. Hey. Yes. It's, uh, it, but it's it's genius level. It's Kanye level. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's so bad, it's good. I wasn't going to say it was bad. Well, I, I meant bad as in the uh, Michael Jackson sense. Right, right. Uh, that's got a different connotation perhaps these days too. It's it's so good, it's good. It's good. It's just over, yeah, yeah it's so good. It's like Jackson Pollock. <laughs> they don't call me the Gina Davis of podcasting for nothing. <laughs> that's right. The Gina Davis of fashion. So, Captain, <laughs> when uh, when I had you on Patreon back over the summer, you were telling me how how entertained or um, I don't know, I guess uh, l- interested by the uh, the action or the um, the movement in the Maura Murray case, and even in like what goes on behind the scenes over uh, over this podcast and over the case. So we talked about that a little bit, um, yeah. And you and I talked last week um, about all this stuff, and uh, just wanted to really connect with you here and uh, discuss this stuff on the air. Yeah, the cast of characters is is really fascinating, right? And it's also really interesting coming from um, you know a father that's a detective that did over four thousand missing person cases to have a case that's sixteen years old and still one of the most popular cases on the internet. And I think that's largely to do with the cast of characters, quote unquote, investigating the case. Okay. And what do you mean by, uh, I I understand what you mean by cast of characters uh, in quotes, investigating the case, but uh, is that, how, how are you, how are you, how are you saying that? Is it, is it a detriment to it or are you saying that they're benefiting it? I, that's, probably in the last week is what I've been debating a lot in my head. I was always uh, pro, well, if you're talking about the case and getting people to talk about the case, then more people hear about it. And there is somebody out there with information uh, that would lead to possibly solving what happened to Mara out there. 
but I also wonder if the conversation is steered in such a, a direction that's in a wrong direction if that person is then just sits back and just kind of laughs at the whole situation and laughs about the theories that are presented on the internet. Okay, uh, I can I can see where you're coming from there because there are several um, individuals that are very loud, and I'd like to think that they're a uh, very vocal minority. And some of them do actually sit back and they like to cause chaos and they do like to laugh about it. Uh, case in point would be uh, Alden Olson with his videos from a few years ago. His whole right. in, his whole intention was to throw chaos into this and just make people. Um, uh, make people paranoid, make people think. Uh, he he basically said that he did it as a practical joke, um, and that's you know his motivation behind that. No one will know. I mean, no one's ever going to actually get the real answer out of him. But I do think that there is a, a much larger segment that works behind the scenes, and a much larger segment that works in the public eye, putting forth more positive uh, talk about the case, and and hopefully saying enough and causing enough of a of a ruckus to maybe get somebody to slip up and talk or intentionally talk. No, no, and I I think that's still possible. Um but I also think it it's the Mar case has become very almost like politics where people take sides on certain stances and then no matter what maybe the other side is bringing to the table it, you know, it's it's kind of like the Republicans could say, we're going to pass this bill to end, the, end homelessness. And Democrats sometimes will go, well, that's good and all, but we're going to vote that down. And then two months later, come back and say, hey, we got this bill to end homelessness. And then the Republicans are like, yeah, we're going to vote that down, but only because of the what side they're on. What do you, not, uh, is there something specific that you're referencing, uh, for like, uh, to, based on that comparison? Uh, well, I just think sometimes that there's theories that are presented or ideas that are presented and those are shot down by individuals maybe too quickly. Oh, I totally agree. This is, this is something that has been going on for probably like seven or eight years with the case. Yeah, it actually it feels bad now because there's topics out there that are that are very sensitive and and more sensitive than topics from the past. But it's there's actually less of that going on now. There was a, there was a time when we couldn't get through a day without multiple emails and uh, constant harassment. Yeah, no, and it's um, I and I just think that's a fascinating fascinating aspect of this case um, compared to other cases. Yeah, because you don't typically see this in uh, cases that you and uh, you and Nick cover. No, in depth. Like, uh, do you see that in um, uh, Brian Schaefer, for example? Because that's that's a case you've done multiple episodes on. Correct. Yeah. No. And there's definitely some camps where you might put out an idea, and it might get shot down by somebody. But it's different in this case because I think there's individuals like John Smith or or even James Renner that will have a theory, let's say, and they're so gun ho about that theory that they start shooting down other ideas. And I just don't know how responsible that is. But again, it's their life. They can do, do whatever they want. Um, I'm not here to try to police any of that. Yeah, absolutely. I, I will say if we're using the comparison between John Smith and James Renner having their own theories, uh, I will say that James Renner is a much more easy uh, adult person to deal with uh, in terms of having a um, uh, an educated debate on, on a topic or on a theory, whereas John Smith will post your address online. Yeah, well, and, and that might be true between you guys and John Smith, but the, oddly, any time I've talked about this case, I've I've had several people say, you know, be careful of John Smith, and every interaction that I've had with him has been very respectful. Um, so it, it's tough because I don't want to talk badly about somebody that every time I've reached out to or every time he's reached out to me, I I felt like he's showed me a level of respect. So yeah. I don't. So if he's not doing that with somebody else, that that then I question why. 
why did it get to that point? Yeah, I, w- I would say 95% of the interactions we've ever had with John were overwhelmingly positive. Yeah. Well, I'll give you the answer why it got to the point with us, if you're looking for an answer, because we decided to do the TV show, and he decided to do the TV show, and he wasn't featured on the TV show as much as we were. Right. Well, I don't know if it was a competitive thing about us. I, I just think um, he might have been frustrated that – uh, the investigative team behind the TV show um, sort of brushed past his theory or whatever, the law enforcement conspiracy right. unveiling, you know? Yeah. And I don't think they brushed it off like they didn't look at it or consider it. I think they talked about it, and they even did a whole, basically a whole episode of The Six on it. Yeah, and I, I actually thought John Smith came off really well on the documentary. I, I, he did. Oh, he did. He came off like a like a friggin' hero. Folk hero. And as I as I thought you guys came off as well too. And it, it and it's been interesting since CrimeCon to have met Julie and to have and the the truth is the majority of our conversation has have not been about her sister. They've just been personal conversations. Um but to hear her thoughts on on the community and it and that's also interesting compared to other cases. Most cases don't have like a community, yeah. but there's definitely a community here. Um, there's such a big community and you can almost feel its pulse. Do you yeah. know what I mean? Like it, it comes and goes and waves when information does too. And, and it sways uh, almost like in the wind. And I don't mean that in a negative way. I just mean that it, uh, it can go one way or another depending on certain things that are yeah. out there. And I actually just hear this through a couple of my friends that are, I, I would say they're in the community. So I'll get text messages about stuff that I don't even know is going on. And, and, and so that's been fascinating to watch a case have a community and how the community reacts to information that is coming out. And is this, uh, again, the same question that I had earlier, is, this, is their reaction something that you think is a benefit or a detriment? I don't know. Okay. It's just like when when you guys had um, the last show I, of your guys as I, I listened to is when you had Renner on uh, talking about the trial that Bill. Uh, but that wasn't the last episode we did. Well, but that's the last one I listened to. Um, <laughs> oh, okay. Guys, I'm busy. I got I'm doing three shows a week. Humble brag. <laughs> no, it's it's not even a <laughs> it's not even a brag anymore. It's just there's a workload that I signed up for that is it's like a runaway train, but. <laughs> The, that's the last one I listened to. And then it becomes a question to me as somebody that's fascinated with people that are researching cases or investigating cases. And I think that term, I think we use a little too loosely, but I don't consider myself an investigator. There's a lot of people that will then also say that they're not, but they're acting as if they are. And so to listen to that last one, it's like, I can see the argument of why people would say that it's a distraction to talk about these things with Bill or about Bill, but I also can see the value in it. But I also think that if you're going to have that conversation about Bill, then it's, well, what is the action now that we, that we have to take after that? Um, and I've had conversations with Renner about this as well. Now that this information's come out, James, where do we go from here? And and that should be more important than I think sometimes it is with, with certain individuals. Yeah, totally agreed. And that's uh, why we set up a, a few uh, subsequent episodes that uh, address the issues of abuse and address other uh, like issues um, so that the, the point can be more uh, abundantly clear. Uh, and during that episode and i think we had it in the show notes we had uh numbers for um like domestic abuse hotlines and and local shelters and it really speaks to a a greater issue of uh of abuse tim had a had a point i don't know if it was in a show or if it was behind the scenes maybe it was in a conversation that we had with uh somebody about uh you know if this was uh charges that were brought against rick forcier what would no one would be no one would be up in arms about something like that. There would be almost no debate about that. Right, but I also think it starts from the beginning because you can't... I think there's a lot... 
again, I used to be of the debate that, or argued for the idea that if you're presenting information and you're talking about the case and getting other people to get interested in the case, then you're doing positive things for the case. But I also think with this case, if we were to go back and and this has happened with several cases, when we go to dive into a case, how much nonsense do we have to brush away first before we actually get to information? And so if you just look at the initial reports of her going missing, when her boyfriend shows up to the scene and who is this individual and what is their character background? And I think it was a little more blurry than led to believe. But even when I talked with Renner initially uh, about Bill, it was always, well, I think he's a stand up guy. And I think a lot of that stuff is, what is it based off of? And to me, the only thing I can see is he has a pattern of, well, if you talk to me, therefore you're a stand up individual. And if you don't talk to me, then somehow you're the enemy. And the willingness to talk or not talk is no evidence of guilt or innocence. No, you're absolutely right on that. Uh, and you cited two examples, or at least one example, of uh, of that with um, with James Renner. And we know that. Well, but there's multiple ones. You got you have Bill Roush, stand up guy because he will talk to me. Yeah, that's one. Yep. Coach Haas. Stand up guy because he'll talk to me. Kate McCopolis, awful individual because she won't talk to me. Fred Murray, awful individual because he won't talk to me. And there's no evidence that Fred is an awful person. I think there's evidence to the contrary of that. I think there's also a lot. Yeah. I think there's also evidence that Kate was willing to talk to James, but then realized that the family wasn't going to be communicating with James and there's no evidence that the family hated James or thought he was an awful human. They just didn't see him being the one to write a book about their family. And then all yeah, of a sudden right. now we have all these accusations against Fred that are based off of nothing. There is no evidence. It's just an idea. And that to me is completely irresponsible. So where do you go from from there? You've had conversations with James and you've expressed this to him? Yeah, but I but it's uh, the first time I met him, you know, I had a a coach friend of mine that was a a, a student coach and and in his situation that if you had a relationship with a student, it could be huge. It could be very it could destroy your life. Meaning that if you're involved with the student and it was found out about and you were like, let's say, post-grad, you're working on your master's, you could be halfway to your master's. They could discredit every course that you had. You could have to pay back all your room and board plus your payroll. And in every case, it's different. Yeah, yeah, I remember when we talked about this last time, we got um, messages about how this uh, this has been um, a scenario at times. Yeah, and it, and it also varies, uh, again, per university. Some universities will say, absolutely not, you cannot have any type of relationship. And then other ones are going to go, well, look, you guys are adults, so as long as it's consent, what well, does it matter? But these are issues that I thought should have been brought up right away, and I also thought, why are we dismissing this person that we know had a, a sexual relationship with the girl that went missing? And this all individual, look, I mean, we made a T-shirt that said the husband did it. Normally, in these cases, yeah. the first people you need to look at are boyfriends, sexual partners, family members, and then keep going to the outer circle. So this guy is somebody that should have been investigated. This guy is somebody that people should have spent time on. I just want to be clear. You're talking about Hussein Baghdadi? Yeah. Okay. The the assistant track coach. Isn't his nickname? Haas. Haas, yeah. 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 I, I don't know how many people know that his nickname's Haas. Well, yeah, and, and you also said uh, boyfriend or, you know, friend or, you know, partner or something like that. So people could have mistook that for Bill, too. Right, right. 
Yeah, and I, I just wanted to be clear that my head was in the right spot too. Well, and when talking to investigators about the Mara case, they, they start with, okay, now we, we need to get an idea of who she was in contact with, and then those people were all on the table. I think Bill, you put Bill on the table, he's first on the table. Anybody that she had an intimate relationship with um, on the table, I think you put any close friends or look, there could have been somebody that was obsessed with her on some level. So now you have that circle and then you have the family circle and that's where you start the investigation. Even though I think a lot of that stuff will probably not matter in this case because she was not even in that area. And then, then, and when you explain to investigators, well, she's what, two and a half hours away from school. If she's not driving with anybody or somebody else is not in the car or there's no tandem driver, then you're looking at that seven minute window being in that area and the location and then local individuals in that area become, I think, more important to look at. Sure. Yeah. Uh, I think you have to look at somebody's patterns. So when, when you talk to somebody and you go, about coaching in the NCAA and you go, okay, well, this is important and I'm going to bring this to this author's a- attention and they're very dismissive of just this idea. And it's simply because this person talked to them. And then I think fast forward to a year later and there was some thought that maybe she was going up there to go to a cabin that was connected to the school well, if this cabin's connected to the school and it's possibly connected to the track um, uh, program or cr- cross country program, then who would have access to this? All oh, the coach. And I got a call from uh, James Renner. Hey, did you hear about this cabin? Oh, that's fascinating. I go, yeah, Haas should be on the list of people to investigate. And he said, yes, he's always been my number two guy. And right, it's like, well, if he's always been your number two guy, then when I talked to you a year ago or a year and a half ago, why were we dismissive of this? I mean, you could. There's an. I'm. There's a number of reasons why he might want to dismiss it. I, you know, I'm. I'm not sure. I can't. I'm certainly not defending anybody here. But if um if you're acting as an investigative journalist. Maybe you're not giving up your top five suspects to to everybody, or you know, maybe you have just a very small circle that you tell people if you tell anybody at all who your top suspects are. No, uh, uh, but, look, if I was investigating a case, nobody would ever know what my theory is, and and I think you guys have been pretty good about not going out on a limb and saying if I had to bet money, this is this is what I think happened. Yeah, absolutely. I yeah. think the difference was, though yeah. is you you can't say that about. You can't say that James has not done that. No, no. Um, I was actually going to follow up with that and say, uh, that being said, you really shouldn't be broadcasting anything anyway. Right. To me, it seems that Mora got into a random person's car, you know? And I think if you don't believe that she got into a random person's car, then I think there's some reason to look into the people around her um, and things like that. Yes. Still, to me, with with Haas um, and Bill, it doesn't seem to make sense that one of them uh, had like was randomly, obviously wasn't randomly driving on that road. If if she got into their car, like I don't think that's what happened at all. You know what I mean? Like uh, both of them maybe would have needed help if that was the case. I just when when I play it out of my head, it's it seems less and less likely. Well, right, but and, and that's great to have those theories, but again, we don't know. So if you have a tandem driver theory, I, I don't think that's impossible. Yeah. But so who was this person? And where is right, the you're evidence? Right, introducing a whole new person. Right. You're, yep. Well, yeah, or somebody in her circle, but then you have yeah. to go, well, where's the evidence to to prove such? You can't just shady behavior from people around her. You can't look to shady or, or I don't know, whatever what you want to call shady or suspicious behavior um, of some people around her, you know? Yeah. And I think, uh, which definitely should not include, you know, talking to you or not. Um, so I, yeah, I mean, obviously we're in agreement there. I, I don't know if, if that's what the criteria between whether Renner thinks someone's a good person or not. Um, I know he did, he did call bill, uh, a Paul Walker type, 
um, at first, one, one of our first episodes um, with him, and then obviously abruptly changed uh, course when, but but w- it was when those allegations came out. Um, well, and you know, I, or, and I, or I should say yeah. when when uh, several women um, went to to Renner, and then he put out um, those allegations. No, no, and I think you're allowed to change your mind when new information presents itself. But I I question what you put out first. You know, maybe you should have been more reserved at first and wait until more information comes out. That that's how I'd approach it personally. Um, but I'm not him and I'm not um he, he can do whatever he wants, you know. Uh, <laughs> yeah, in agreement there. I if I ever was the first person to receive information like that, I first would shit my pants and then I would um probably take a year and a half before I even came close to an answer aside from bring this to uh, the police. Right. And then, and I don't know all the details because I I have to just because we're on to the next case every week that I could only dip my toes into certain cases. And so even with like what's happening now with him, Yes, there's a protection order. I also think you have to look at a lot of the accusations that are uh, made against him and and understand that that was a consensual relationship. You're talking about the accusations that was made by um, by the female. Yes, which led to the protection order. The protection order, and it's also I think there's twenty some, um. Abu- you know, sexual abuse classes or what, whatever Bill has to take. And and I just want to be clear, the uh, the accuser did say that this started as a consensual relationship, but then deteriorated into something that was abusive. That's what you, you, you said, that it was consensual. You, so I just well, that's what I'm that saying. That, that, yeah, yeah, you're you're completely correct. It, it started out as consensual. Yeah. I would also argue that you have to then start at the beginning of the consensual relationship and understand that both people were having an affair and, and how do you characterize those people for doing that action? Um, everybody has their different moral compasses. And I'd also argue that there was probably some stuff that happened in both individuals, both in the, the victim in this case and in, in bill in this case that led them to, think that these actions were okay you mean the action of having an affair yeah the starting of the consensual relationship and and then i also think i also think it's a very deep and difficult situation that if you're not involved in it or you're not friends with each individual and and you have to be able to hear both sides to really have a full understanding of what that all entailed but i i think these are both people show a lot of questionable behavior and i think that has to be put into account when you're looking at at that situation yeah 100 percent. and again not sorry to be uh, redundant with all of this when you say both people you mean bill and the accuser yeah i mean okay look Here's what we do know of Bill. Bill was dating a girl that he possibly was going to get married to or wanted to get married to that went missing. That also has become one of the biggest or most talked about cases on the internet. Um, His time serving the country and what effect that has had on him mentally and then you know, with the with the suicide in his family, what devastation that could cause to an individual, uh, and that's not to give somebody an excuse. You know, me and Tim talked, and whatever people's preferences are sexually, or what somebody would suggest or want done to them, that doesn't mean that that I can't say that's questionable behavior, because I I, I definitely think it is. But I think you have to take a look at the whole picture. But then then you got to get back to the case. After this information that we've learned, what does this mean? And does this mean that Bill has the capability of 
being in a being an abuser, being controlling, and would that give reasons uh, for Mar to not want to be around him, uh, to possibly want to start a new life, like like Brenner has suggested in the past? You know, I don't know. I I think you can connect A to B there. Yeah, and we know just from talking to Julie and uh, and other people that. Uh, they had a long relationship. Maura and Bill had a long relationship. There was uh, lots of letters that were written uh, back and forth um, between the two of them. And there was also the, uh, you know, the the accounts that he might be, you know, acting possessive at some times. Well, and I think if you look into Bill, so, so if Bill gets brought back on the table, now you have to then re-examine this individual. And so... Again, is it muddy in the waters because you talked to this in, individual back in the day and said that he was a stand-up guy, Paul Walker type? Does this muddy the waters to go back and to look into this guy? And if you look at his phone records, which I spent a lot of time looking at and and, and talking with another investigator about or talking to an investigator about the case, the the amount of calls that he makes on Monday to Tuesday, which would set up a very good alibi. But the other interesting thing is I said, um, well, they said, is this a concerned boyfriend calling his missing girlfriend? I said, or a possessive one. And then their reply was, or is it both? You know, um, it can, it can be both. Yeah. Also, at that time, she was not missing for very long. Yeah. Uh, not not saying that that should be taken into account at all. But once he was there and present with the family and searching, he obviously was able to talk to the family and and didn't have to make a ton of phone calls to Fred. Uh, and it and it is very obvious when he was going through security uh, on his way to New Hampshire. When he was traveling from Fort Sill, uh, you can almost see like the entire uh, route. You can see the whole timeline based on those phone calls. Um, right. And when you're talking about being a possessive boyfriend, I don't know. I mean, maybe maybe he was just acting the way uh, I think he was 24. Was he 24, 25? I know he was a couple years older. I, I yeah. forget. But yeah, I, I think mean, he was maybe 23. Yeah, 23. He was a young man uh, who was trying to work on a long distance relationship so maybe he did get these bouts of natural jealousy or possessiveness that just like an yeah. undeveloped young man's brain doesn't have the capability to take a step back and say uh you know if i just approach something reasonably this is going to work itself out or I'll, I'll be able to work it out instead he makes like uh x amount of calls in a half hour does that make sense? No, it makes tons of sense. But we, And I think we all can put ourselves in positions that you're dating somebody and they're, they're going out with people or they're, they're traveling or something. And there's times that you call somebody and they don't answer their phone right away or you send a text and they don't answer right away and you don't worry about it. You put your phone back down, you start watching the football game or whatever it is you're doing. And then there's other moments that you make a call and you're not busy doing something else and then you, it clicks. Why haven't they called me yet? And mm -hmm. sometimes you can then create scenarios in your head to start, you know, freaking out. One time I was going to, I was living in Indiana and I was supposed to come and play in Columbus, which is about an hour and a half away. And Nick was going to meet me, uh, to hang out at the bar. And I called the singer and said, hey, there's no way I'm going to make it. Weather's bad, blah, blah, blah. And he's like, no, no problem. We'll play the gig without you. Nick goes up and goes, hey, where's the captain? He goes, um, didn't hear him. So he just said, oh, yeah, I, I don't know. And then after the third song in, Nick started freaking out like, where the hell is he? You know, like maybe something happened when he was driving. So he starts texting and calling me. But for whatever reason that day, I put my phone on the charger and just went away. Uh, then when I get back to my phone, I had hundreds of missed calls, hundreds of, uh, of missed texts, you know. 
And when I got a hold of him, he was freaking out. Like he, um, he just created all these scenarios in his head. Um, yeah. And, and it just freaked him out. Um, and we, to this day, like I laugh about it and, he, and you can tell he's still upset about it, but, uh, no. And so is that what he's doing? And then I also think too, I mean, me and Tim kind of talked about this. If these behaviors are questionable and suspicious of this boyfriend, and then you go back and look at this person and look at the evidence on which you can find, you then shouldn't make the leap of, I can't put him in New Hampshire on Monday or Tuesday, and he d- doesn't get there till Wednesday or whenever he gets there. And and so since that doesn't make sense, I now come up with this theory that I'm going to promote saying that, well, then something later on the week had to happen tomorrow. And therefore, I'm still, sh- I'm now shining the light completely on Bill with no evidence. And now I'm creating another new theory again with no evidence. Okay. So you're talking about James Renner again. Um, <laughs> yeah. Perhaps saying that he knew I where. Can't wait till he calls me about this. Oh, yeah. you know? <laughs> He's speaking generally, Lance. <laughs> uh, so the 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 theory is that she went somewhere and she was then located uh, a few days later, and something was done to her. Right by Bill, and I mean I've heard him state that. I don't know if that's the theory that he's, you know, currently sticking with, and I'm sure this sounds like oh. Captain talks shit about James Renner day. Um, and that's not the case. I mean, Tim, I don't think Lance helped us because Lance was too busy with his musk. But I know, uh, Tim, you, you did some recordings with us in, in True Crime Garage and, and James Renner are doing a project together that will be released in February. So, uh, you know, we ha- we also have a working relationship as well. So... But but I'm trying to just look at it, look at it from an outsider, what I see from the outside, um, and I don't think I'm in like the inner circle, even though I've been lucky to talk to Julie. Yeah, yeah, it's a uh, it's a, a really um, interesting situation to be in. Like you said, we're not investigators, and we're not part of the family. We're not even uh, you know secondhand friends of someone who might have been a friend uh, to any one of the victims that that we talk about so it's interesting how to approach this and how to field all the theories that are out there most of them come from social media some of them come from uh emails and people say to you know keep it private uh but we do know that julie has said on numerous occasions that uh everyone should be considered and including her family yeah you know she'd even say like consider consider herself but once that's done once you've ruled that out rule it out yeah Uh, because she wants to make sure that the the goal is still uh firmly set upon finding her sister now how much of that do you put out there on social media do you think that that is the problem that some people need to have the scoop well no i think everybody has different motives for why they do what they do and then i think sometimes those aren't clear just like um Aaron Larkin, for example, the the funny thing about Aaron is had a lot of conversations with Aaron on Twitter, just through like DMs and just constantly battling constantly. She's very confrontational. What? And then we meet at crime con and she was just as confrontational. And, and still to this day, when I talk to her, she's just as <laughs> confrontational as she first was. And so I think there's when some of the actions by Bill and some of these accusations against Bill have been presented online, I don't really understand what her motive motivation is for defending him. That's not that clear. But but I also think she's done a good job when all the information did come out and some of the arguments that I've had with her, I, I it led me back to okay. Well, Bill needs. We need to go back to square one with Bill, and for her to actually take that time and go back through the information she's found, and I mean, we've spent hours going back through that information. Um, basically, prove to me that this guy is not involved. 
prove to me that this guy is not riding in the car with her. And then we can move on to the next step. And for most people, they just say, I'm not going to waste my time. So I don't know why she defends certain actions, but I think she does do a good job of, even though she believes something, she's willing to take the time to try to prove that. And, and with, with actual information, I'll, I'll say I think she's made it very clear why she defends Scott and why she defends Bill because she said it numerous times that they were found, Scott was found not guilty. And that's, she said that Scott has helped out the family a lot and he's provided a lot of, uh, a lot of resources for the family, uh, in their search. And he has these accusations. I don't know if they're formal charges. I don't want to have the semantics of what I say get torn apart. He was not like, I don't know if he was formally charged. I don't think he was, but there was definitely an investigation and she defended him. He was found not guilty. So I guess you do have to have formal charges if you're going to have a verdict in the first place. And she has been very clear by saying that not guilty means not guilty. So, uh, so well, right, and I think that it's also depends on how you look at the system. If the system is innocent till proven guilty, and I don't know Scott that well, I I spent you know several hours with him at CrimeCon, um, and that's it. That's all I know about him. And here's a situation: innocent till proven guilty, proven not guilty, that should equal innocence. But the problem is the charges. Um, those types of charges stick. Those types of charges or even accusations of anything, any harm to any child, those accusations stick. Those ac- accusations normally matter, and they also ruin people's lives. If he didn't do it and was falsely accused or whatever, I feel awful for him. But these are also, I think, I, I don't know, to, again, stepping back from it, if this person was involved in a search, but I created a relationship with this person, this person was my friend, and I believe this person, then I think you should stand up for your friends. You should stick up for your friends um, if you believe they're innocent. That being said, if you're running an organization like Walmart or you're running a company, would you even want somebody that was accused of those things working with your company. And I think that's a question for each individual company to answer for themselves. Does that make any sense? Yeah. yeah. I, are you, are you referencing his involvement in this? Yeah. And again, but I had a very, very long, uh, interview with Julie. Uh, we talked for about two hours and then we stopped taping and I wish we would have continued, um, uh, because the next hour was, amazing because she's in the situation that her sister went missing. Her father has worked his ass off. Nothing like his whole life revolves around trying to figure out what happened to his daughter. And now she's stepping to the forefront really. And, and again, a, a case that has a community, which is just normally not the case. So now she's stepping out and, and she doesn't know what to do sometimes. Mm-hmm. And so we had this really long, I mean, it was like, like I said, like an hour and a half, probably just talking about what I think she should do. Um, and I think at the end of the day, you have a goal and however you think you can get to that goal you have to do everything in your power to do that. So you're not looking back 10 years from now. She's been missing 16 years. Maybe maybe 30% of the community stops caring in another four years. Maybe 50% stop caring in six years. Maybe everybody that's ever heard of Mara's case does not care in 10 years. And not saying that they don't care, but at some point they just become disinterested in the case and nobody's talking about it mm-hmm. and and you don't want to be at that end going well I really wish I would have been more vocal or I really wish I would have just said this is what's happening and this is how we're moving forward and you're either with us or you're against us and I don't think that she would be wrong in doing that that she would be wrong in pitting people with them or against them no, not not even against us, but 
I think if you're looking at different individuals, if you think they're hurting something for whatever reason, I mean, she has to live with herself. And that's kind of been my theme through this whole conversation is every individual has to live with themselves and answer for themselves. So if she has become friends with Scott and she feels like he is valuable and she believes in the system and he's innocent till proven guilty and he wasn't proven guilty, therefore he's innocent. And she says, he is helping me and I need all the help I can get. And I just have to then tell people, look, this person's innocent and he's going to work with, he's going to be a part of our team and we're moving forward. And if, and if people talk trash about you online, that's on them. And, and everybody's has a right to their opinion, but don't let those opinions affect your decisions to try to move forward in the best way possible to get answers on what happened to your sister. That was my advice to her. Yeah, yeah no, oh, and that's solid totally. advice. That's it's good uh, advice. It's just uh, it's very unfortunate that you have to be talking about the types of people that have, even if they've been um, not founded accusations against them. Like this is the, this person's helped out your family so much and we totally understand why you'd want to continue working with this person. It's absolutely reasonable. If I was in the same situation, I don't know what I would do. You know, I would probably, I'd probably look at the value of what they brought to the table if my sister was missing right. and I would probably put any charges on the back burner. I don't know. Um, and that's a, that's a tough decision that she has to make. And I don't even know if uh, you or I or Tim or anybody are, uh, were in the position to give her any sort of advice. Uh, but I'm not saying your advice was bad by any means. I'm just saying uh, it's just a very uh, delicate situation to be in on, on everyone's end. Yeah, I also told her to just give up and, and start drinking heavily and doing drugs. That was my other advice. I don't well, know. there's got to be uh, there's no in between. <laughs> yeah, um, I'm like it's one or the other, right? It's one or the other. It's it's you need to decide. It's all in or Julie, it's... I was screaming. You need to decide yeah. right now what you want to do. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, she's too disciplined to do that. No, no. But the other thing that I don't think people have questioned is why do we know about this information? He's an administrator for a website and an administrator for a a Facebook page. Why is this information coming out about him? I mean, doesn't does anybody find that strange? I find it very strange, and and it's like and and that's what I was talking about when I talk about the community of this case, and to sit back and just go all of a sudden one day it's posted and it's like Twitter is blowing up, and I was like, Scott, is this the same Scott that I met at CrimeCon, the guy that yeah. answers questions on Facebook and helps with her website that that guy yeah i find it i find it very strange that someone felt the need to put it out there i find all of this incredibly strange i have no idea how to dissect the uh the motivation behind that it's very strange to me but again uh i mean i think i know where it came from but i'm not going to get into that no but it's very strange and that would be like some weird stuff coming out about your um, you know, Tim or Lance, you know, it, it'd be strange. You just do a podcast about a missing person case. Yeah, it would be, it would be really weird. I think the, the community's concern when that, um, information came out was that maybe he was, uh, getting some of the information and he shouldn't have been. And, um, and so I, th that is, is not a concern really. I mean, like you said, he, he is a moderator for that Facebook page. He is not an admin of that page. And, um, the, he does not have access to the email address that the family uses, so I, I, some of those concerns, I think, that were initially out there are not, um, sh you know, not really concerns. Well, right. But and the frustrating thing for me on, like, again, like I said, from the outside is who cares? If, I, if I'm the family, my only concern is trying to figure out what happened to my sister or my daughter. And I don't care. If these people are helping me, if somebody's helping me and giving me their time and I think they're innocent of whatever charges or accusations are against them and I think they can benefit me and they want to give me their time and effort and give me their life, give me parts of their life to try to figure out what happened to my daughter or happened to my sister, 
I am going to utilize every person I could. And if somebody said, well, they're a little questionable, well, what the hell is somebody that's even a little questionable going to do to derail the case? And again, this is just my personal speculation. I think for the family that sometimes the stuff that happens on the internet is very overwhelming. Yeah. And they and it's hard to spend the time on that. I mean, you have Julie has a business to run. She has a life to um live and at the same time devote as much time as she can to try to figure out what happened to her sister. And I think that that's where that information to get on the for that information to become such a talked about topic in the community and for then people to spend so much time on it to me that kind of stuff is a big distraction oh it's a it's a huge distraction and believe believe you me or however the saying goes i personally wish that it never happened uh it goes beyond uh, it being a distraction for Maura Murray's disappearance. I just want to back up and say, uh, yes, uh, Julie Murray has a business to run. It's a, she wants to focus as much time as she possibly can on finding her sister. She has numerous outlets, and she's aware of this. She right. has numerous outlets that, that she uses. She's in a, as bad as a situation as she's in with her sister, she's in a very fortunate situation as far as trying to utilize and mobilize a community to help her find her sister. She's got hundreds and hundreds and thousands of people who want to help her find her sister. And, and she feel, I, I, I believe that she feels very fortunate to have those, yes, uh, those people there, that community there. Well, and this is a fact. I mean, when, when I talk to her, the thing I love about her is she is no bullshit. She is no bullshit. I think when she when she talks, you can just feel the truth in there. And the amount of respect that she has for you guys for putting the time and the effort and again, taking away from your life to try to figure out what happened to her sister. The amount of respect that she has for I you certainly guys. wasn't uh I wasn't trying to uh f- fish for a compliment there. I just yeah, want right. to be clear on that. No, but it, it but it goes it goes beyond that. She also had you know she might disagree with John Smith and she might disagree with some of the stuff that Renner says, um, and she might disagree with like the way the production was, um, and Maggie and Art and and disagrees with Laren, uh, Aaron Larkin a lot. But the amount of respect she has for each individual for trying to figure out what happened. And to devoting so much of their life to it, um, you can just see inside her. And again, she doesn't agree with everybody, and she doesn't have to, um, but but she does respect everybody. And I and I think that's, uh, I mean, the character of her is is very interesting. And um, I don't know. I wouldn't just, fuck with her. Have you seen her <laughs> yeah. pictures? She have you probably, seen her her CrossFit pictures? I she's got muscles on her back that I didn't even no like we're possible i won't get into the crossfit conversations because normally we talk we talk about and she she's a trash talker so (laughs) she's a constantly talking shit um but no and i I just it's funny because after the hour-long conversation of me going you need to do this because you don't want to be going you don't want to be going it's been 30 years that my sister's been missing and and at some point some point you have to walk away and say we just probably will never know. You 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 didn't tell her that, did you? No, I, I mean I did. I, I mean we were it was it was a very honest conversation that I mean because because we've dealt with that with the show, we've dealt with people that just say you know what we think we know what happened to our son or daughter, we can't prove it, but we just have to move on. Yeah, I see. And and that is devastating. And I've also talked to parents or siblings or boyfriends or girlfriends that have met, you know, that have lost that person that they're like, I wish I would have done this and I wish I would have done this and I wish I would, you know what I mean? And I didn't. And now, now I'm at to, at a point where I have to stop and now I have to move on and it's devastating and I'll do anything in my power to help them as, as I know you guys will. And that's, the reason why I set out 
take time out of my day to talk to you guys uh, and about some things that aren't comfortable. I mean, I don't agree with certain actions of certain people. Uh, that also doesn't mean that I don't respect them. Um, but we're we're here to talk about you know raising money and that there's searches to be done and there's tests to be done and that well can run dry. Yeah, it sure can. And there is a GoFundMe out there and you can find that. There's a link in the show notes or you can find it by searching on GoFundMe.com. And uh, before we let you go, because we have already gone an hour here, Captain, um, and, and there is still so much to talk about. We could easily do a two or three parter. Um, but uh, on the Bill Roush stuff, before we go, um, I just wanted to point out that it sounded like you were you were see, saying that you it, it seems to you that Bill's behavior is a result of Mora going missing and you know he obviously wasn't the cause of that um, even if you were to assume the allegate though any allegations about Bill were true mm-hmm. it still doesn't change the fact that he was in Oklahoma when Mora went missing maybe the cause of some actions now was was started then is that kind of what you're saying no, and I don't want to say that it's an excuse, but when I, I think psychology is very interesting, and I think looking at this person's life, again, your girlfriend, possibly somebody that you thought you'd marry, goes missing, becomes an internet sensation. There's books about her. There's docu- documentaries about her. Um, I mean, heck, you guys retweeted something that he tweeted. Oh yeah. I mean, he's living in a a pretty odd universe. Yeah. And then also the the his time in service. Um this individual did serve our country. I respect those actions. I don't know what happened there. I know a lot of friends that have gone and served our country and and bad things have happened. I have friends I have a really good friend that is not the same person that I was friends with when he left. And when he came back, he's a whole different person. And I don't even know what happened. I, we don't talk about it, but he is not the same guy. And then I've also had uh, friends that um, have had suicides in their family that it has just wrecked them. And they have done things that they, their life you know, take a drastic turn. So I think that plays into all this. And and again, make no mistake, you're responsible for your actions, no matter what happened to you. So I don't want it to make it sound like I'm giving him an excuse at all, but I think that's stuff that is not discussed about because it's not that popular also too. Well, yeah, I don't think you're making an excuse. And and I just kind of want to summarize what I what I what direction I thought you were going in um a while ago. And Captain, you referenced the phone call that we had um and we where we talked about, yeah, I mean, honestly, that seems a lot more likely to me that um that Bill has some emotional um, you know, scars from that and and possibly being in the military. That is much more likely than him having, you know, making more go missing, I think. Yeah, no, and I think all those things are signs of his questionable behavior and and possibly abusive behavior. But also, the, I think this is also a situation where they charged, they didn't charge him with anything, but they are administering a protection order. Um, I think he will follow that. And again... It's stuff like putting out that he has to go to 12 um, domestic violent classes or wh- whatever the classes are. It's, it's not 12. I think it's like 22. <laughs> they took this a little more serious. But I also think this guy has some issues inside him, and he knows that. Um, and he's and, and from what I hear, he's going to the classes, and I think that he'll not only learn about some of his questionable behavior, but maybe he'll start questioning why he did that in the first place. 